look at the last in Luke, we look at the story of the lost son or the prodigal son, which is really a story about the loving father. Seeing our Lord's desire to help those who have lost the path of life, showing us that our God leads with love. In the next few chapters, Jesus continues to teach by parable and sayings, he heals, he blesses children, he tells his disciples one last time that he will be betrayed and die, but on the third day rise again. When we reach chapter 19, it begins with the story of Jesus. And Zacchaeus, always like that new old man, gives me hope, <laughs> teaches us really that even rich men, and we are all rich by the world's uh, standards, my friends, can find salvation. This is the parable of the ten pounds, a scandalous text about not squandering the gifts that God has given us. The Lord has invested in us, and absolutely, God expects us to produce fruit. And that brings us to the reading for today. Jesus' triumphant entry. <coughs> reading from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 and 40 in the NSRB. Mm -hmm. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethpage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why do you untie it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner asked, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the ground. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. This is the word of the Lord. God is so seeking, thanks be to God. For one of God of sacrifice, surrender, and love, there are no limits to your mercy, no limits to your justice. And yet, your ways are not our ways. And we have trouble understanding the love that sets the world free. Bring meaning and purpose to our lives. Let your Holy Spirit conform our wills that we may give ourselves over in surrender. That our very lives may shout the Hosanna. Bless the speaking, the hearing, and the living of your holy world. Amen. Why do you do it? I mean, why did he go? Why did he go to Jerusalem? When he knew, he knew they would kill him. And not just kill him by hanging him on a tree, but they would humiliate him. They would flog and beat him. They would do everything in their power to discredit him distance him from his followers and he would die. Left there on a cross between two common criminals, a Roman death to dissuade others from causing trouble. Why did Jesus go to Jerusalem when he knew they would kill him? Some may say, well, it was God's will. Now, that statement might be helpful to us, and some of us may even make it ourselves. But in a lot of ways, it lacks the depth of meaning. It's a very complex, well, and simple in other ways. But a lot of times when we think about that question, for many of us, in the traditions that we grew up in, it leads us to a discussion about 
sacrificial atonement. And I thought about preaching about sacrificial atonement and my take on it, which many of you probably would disagree with, but uh, it's a discussion, and I am happy to have that discussion. I didn't move in that direction in the sermon, but if you want to talk about that after this service, I am more than willing you can sit down and talk about what sacrificial atonement and, and how to understand that and, and some things of, of why I do not think that's the most faithful way to understand the salvation of Jesus Christ. But let me suffice it to say this, though. When you take Jesus' life and ministry, his commitment to agape love and justice, there is a certain inevitability to the cross. In other words, if you stand up for love, if you stand up when it really matters, the world is going to kill you. Uh, you only need to look at the death of Martin Luther King Jr. to know that's true. I mean, when you stand up for a dream where all have dignity and self-worth, it has its cost. But my friends, it's not just that Jesus died on the cross. It's that he was resurrected. I don't want to jump too soon to Easter because you have to go through the cross, you have to go through Good Friday to reach Easter. Just like Jim said, you've got to go through your valley sometime before you can get up to that mountain. <coughs> but to say that Jesus was resurrected, that he rose again on the third day, it, it changes the whole scenario. Because what it ultimately teaches us is that path of sacrifice, and surrender and love, on the outside, it may look like it leads to death. It might even look like failure. But we know it leads to life. We know it leads to meaning. It leads to this answer of calling of what God wants of all of us in our faith and in our life. We know it leads life. When silence is not an option. When the crowds were shouting out the words of Psalm 118, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Interesting, actually Luke is the only one who translates that as king. It actually says, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Some of the Pharisees told Jesus, make him stop. But he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stone now what does that mean? When are the times in your life, the times in this world, when silence is not an option? The triumph entry into Jerusalem by Jesus could only have been an all-inspiring celebration. They had heard the stories. They had seen some of the miracles. Others were amazed at the wisdom of his teachings. Here was a man that was rightly touched by God. He had authority. You could just tell it. Was he the one to redeem Israel? And I want to remind you, my friends, that those Israelite people, they were under siege. Jerusalem was under siege. The whole area, it didn't belong to the Jews. It belonged to Rome. With Roman laws, magistrates and soldiers and Rome was notorious for brutally eliminating any potential dissension or uprising or trouble. The Israelite people had lived under the boot of Rome for far too long and they longed for freedom, for liberty, for the right to worship their God. And so when this Jesus of Nazareth comes riding into town, the once capital of Israel, the people had to be thinking that this Jesus might be the one. This might be the Messiah, the Savior, the one who would overthrow the Romans, the one who would put Israel back on the map, restore the old kingdom, bring prosperity and power back to the Israelite people. They offered tribute. Shouted songs 
palms and prayed. They laid down their cloaks and palm branches to honor their future king. And what must have been a grand procession. Hosanna, they cried. You know that Hosanna literally means save us. It's an expression of joy and praise with the conviction that one is about to be delivered. They were putting all their hopes on this Jesus that he would save them. And there was no way they could remain silent. Perhaps it was the enthusiasm of the crowd. Perhaps their need for salvation was just too great. Perhaps this was finally the one bit of hope they could cling to. After a life of poverty and despair and oppression, they saw in Jesus their one chance for restoration, their one chance for a new life. If God was going to save them, surely it would be through this Jesus of Nazareth. Now let's step back for a moment, because in many ways I hope you realize that this triumphant entry into Jerusalem is riddled with irony. There's a lot of irony in this story. I hope you realize that the version of salvation that Jesus Christ brings, <coughs> that we know that Jesus brings, is not anything like what those people in the crowd were hoping for. What they wanted, what they hoped for. I mean, they wanted a king. They, they were battered Israelites in that crowd. That's what they hoped for. They wanted a Messiah. And we have to remember that up to this point, Messiahs were always military leaders. They led uprisings. They overthrew their oppressors. So put yourself in their shoes. Don't you think they want Jesus to pick up the sword? <coughs> they had the people. They had the enthusiasm. And with God on their side, which was obvious when Jesus was cloaked in such power, they would surely overthrow the Romans. And you and I know that is not the kind of salvation that Jesus brings. And knowing that, you know, um, there are clues in the sword, if you notice. Though the crowds were shouting Hosanna and calling Jesus king, I mean, how does he enter? He enters on a colt, a young animal. That doesn't seem like a military parade to me. I don't know. If Jesus was starting an uh, armed uprising, don't you think he'd choose a different animal to ride? Maybe a gallant stallion come in on a chariot? And those of us who have been following along in Luke's gospel, in any of the gospels for that matter, we know this, this Jesus, he is not a man of war. He is not a man of violence. He's a man of peace. This is the guy who taught us to turn the other cheek, to love our enemies, and even pray for those who persecute us. <laughs> but even saying all this, even though we know that Jesus is not that kind of Messiah, <coughs> what do you think the Romans thought about this guy and this parade? Just what do you think the Romans thought about this prayer? When all these people are calling this guy what? King. They're calling him king. And they're shouting Hosanna. What's that mean? Figure out what that means, the Romans tell somebody else. It means save us. It means save us. I mean, my goodness, just look at the world around us today. Dictators, they don't take too kindly to protest, do they? Usually political leaders of any fashion, they don't like protests. And what does this look like? It has all the marks and flavors of insurrection, of a revolt. And what do the Romans do when they catch even a whiff of trouble? They crush it. They make an example out of the leaders, so this kind of thing won't ever 
happen again. <coughs> now many of us can understand the Romans' point of view. Many may wonder why, why is it not emphasized more in the Gospels? Because Jesus was certainly executed by the Romans. There's really too many reasons, I think. First of all, the writers of the Gospels and the communities of the early church, they were still living under Roman occupation. And be careful. There was an uprising in the year 90 or so when the temple got destroyed. They had to be careful in their writings that were being circulated among their communities, lest they raise suspicion from their Roman rulers. But not only that, they didn't need to put them in there because it was so obvious if you lived during that time. Now the other reason is that the writers of the Gospels were often in a theological battle with the Jewish elite. Rome was more of an outside threat. But when you're struggling to find the truth of God and God's word and God's deliverance, that's an inside threat. And that's more heart-wrenching. And more than that, think about the time. The Jewish people living under Roman rule, they walked a very careful line when it came to faith. Rome certainly didn't believe in the Hebrew God. They had their own gods. But the Romans realized they needed proxies. They needed intermediaries to keep control. The Jews on the other side may not like the Romans, but if they were going to practice their religion in any fashion at all, they had to succumb to Roman rule. And in this delicate balance, the Jewish elite, who actually benefited from the arrangement, those folks, what do you think they thought about this Jesus? Who seemed to be wrecking everything. To me, it seems obvious that the course that the Jewish leaders, that they conspired with the Roman authorities to get rid of Jesus, it makes perfect sense. And some may even have thought that it was better for one man to die than for the Romans to come in with their military might and brutally crush a political uprising. Because <coughs> even if this Jesus could unite the Hebrew peasants, what chance did they really have against the might of the Roman Empire. If this coronation parade was not enough, right after this happens, and Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, he goes into the temple, and he overturns the tables of all the vendors. It's a huge scene, very disruptive. Now he was not just forming a resistance, but he was upsetting the economy as well, making a huge scene and messing with people's money. But though the crowd will eventually turn on Jesus, even with a call to crucify him, we know that what they said in that coronation procession was still the gospel truth. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. This Jesus was their King. Maybe not the King or the Messiah that they really thought they needed, is the King and the Savior that the world needs. This is our Messiah, Jesus the Christ, Lord of Lords and King of Kings, Son of God. Maybe they didn't quite understand it, but they still had to give witness because their eyes had seen the glory of the Lord, and God was there before them in human form. Thinking of all this, I know there are times when we cannot be silent about our faith, when we face injustice or we witness poverty or oppression or something that is just not right, we know we must say something. And when we experience the glory of the Lord, when we know that we are seeing God at work before us in our very midst, whether in a cause, or a healing, or a reconciliation, or a hope, or a restoration, we know we too must speak, and tell, and share. Because silence 
is not an option. And likewise, my friends, when facing difficult, even insurmountable odds, when facing dictators and governments who refuse to do what is right, we must speak, even knowing the cost. Jesus showed us the way. He is the one who has the, wor the words that lead to eternal life. We need not be afraid, because God is with us. And the Lord will help us to bear the crosses that will change this world. The United Methodist pastor named Donald Shelby wrote a book called Bold Expectations of the Gospel. It tells the story of the days in East Germany when they lived under a oppressive regime. And a, there was a young man in their church that was deeply involved in their community. He was seized by the communists and he never returned. And now, sometime later, another young man who was actually known as a hardened leader in the communist organized youth movement he began attending services at their church, youth meetings. And the congregation, they, they were suspicious of this guy. They, they wondered, and so the pastor privately took him aside. He asked him, what? Why are you coming? And the young man replied, well, you know the fellow from your church who was seized and taken away? Of course, the pastor said, we... I knew him well, but we haven't heard from him since. <coughs> well, said the visitor, I saw him. I saw him when he was being harassed and tortured. Not only did he refuse to betray his friends, but through it all he never showed bitterness towards those that were tormenting him, even in his hour of death. There was no anger in his heart towards those who were about to kill him. Instead, he spoke of Jesus Christ and forgiveness and grace and God's love. And the young man concluded, and when I saw him die, I knew I must come in spite of what it will cost me to learn of his cross and the love of his enemies that strengthen them even in his last hours. When silence is not an option. Not only are there times when we must speak and shout our hosannas, recognizing Christ in our midst and the love we must share, there are also times when we must let our lives speak the grace and love and justice of our God, even knowing the cost. This is the true message of Palm Sunday, that Jesus went to Jerusalem willingly to show the world that love is greater than hate, and even that life is greater than death. This is the way of Christ, and this is the way that God transforms the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.